So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next panel of amazing judges. The first is Joy Marcus. Joy Marcus is a partner at DFJ Gotham. She came all the way from New York to join us. Joy, please come on up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Anywhere? Anywhere you want. Next is, and I hope I do not butcher this, Margit Wenmakers comes to us from Andreessen Horowitz. She's a partner there, and she is absolutely fabulous and wearing really wonderful shoes. <laughs> right? <laughs> we were all enjoying them backstage. <laughs> Next, rounding out the male VC component, we have Naval Ravikant, who is the founder and managing partner of AngelList. And if you don't know AngelList, you should. You should go online right now and figure it out because it's definitely, as entrepreneurs, you should know what AngelList is. And last but certainly not least, our founder and chairman of Joyous, Ms. Sukinder Singh Cassidy. Now, as they're getting set up, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what these judges are deciding on. So they are going to determine the best overall team. We had one division in the first round. We have another second round going on right now. The overall team that gets the most virtual money from our investors is the best overall team. And they will advance to the next round, and I'll talk all about that at the award ceremony. But Basically, it's a pretty big deal. The other three awards that they're going to be advising or getting to and helping us decide on has to do with being disruptive, being a great team, all the things that matter as entrepreneurs. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up our next and first person in this round, Ms. Susan Nichols from Doc Ponds. I'm sorry, I think we're ahead of ourselves. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm so sorry about the technical error, errors earlier. I really hope this is worth the wait. My name is Susan Nicholas, and I'm the founder of Doc Ponds. Now, the US healthcare industry is, is broken, as we all know. Uh, it's very expensive, it's confusing, it's fragmented, and most importantly, it does not provide Americans with the type of healthcare services that they need. Uh, DocPond solves this problem by having an online platform for the purchase of outpatient health care services. It does not require uh, any insurance to purchase or redeem a DocPond's coupon. Um, thereby, it removes the most significant barrier to having equal access to care. Our, now, the outpatient care industry is an $850 billion market. It accounts for 41% of the total U.S. health care expenditure. Uh, and it's the fastest growing segment at 7.5% annually. Now, there are 81 million Americans that are either uninsured or uninsured, and we expect these 81 million people to be among our early adopters of DocPond services. We expect to sell an average DocPond coupon for $100 for a primary care service. Uh, as you can see, with simply 1% penetration of our target market, DocPonds Doc can generate 81 million in annual revenue within 20% penetration of our target market, that number goes up to 1.62 billion in annual revenue just by the sale of our DocPonds coupons alone. Now DocPonds has the potential to revolutionize the healthcare system. For the first time in history, every American can have access to healthcare without an insurance requirement. We expect that um, we can decompress emergency departments across the United States by providing local access to outpatient care to the uninsured and underinsured. We can expect price adjusting in the outpatient care market, reduced outpatient administrative cost, and yes, DocPond is the answer to patient care volume issues and revenue cycle management with outpatient, in the outpatient industry. Um, we will break down our target market into the 48 million small employees of small businesses, um, the 17 and a half million college students, and 35 million seniors uh, who are aged 55 to 64 that do not yet qualify for Medicare. Our, our B2B customer or outpatient care providers uh, of all stripes who provide same-day services for the American people. Now let's see if I can start this. This is our product. Um, I don't have a clicker to... Oh, I'm sorry, I went to YouTube. This sounds like a job for dog pods. <laughs> Thanks, Diggity Doc. No matter what 
treatment you need, there's a Doc Pond for you, or two or three. One of Doc Pond's daily coupons delivered straight to your inbox for quality outpatient care. If you're uninsured or underinsured, or even if you just want some extra special care, Doc Pond's has you covered. No insurance is required to get Doc Pond's deals. From dental and vision care to pediatrics and gynecology, from psychology and psychiatry to chiropractic and podiatry, from preventative and wellness care to urgent care, Doc Pods helps you save big on all the treatments you need. It's free to subscribe. Just visit DocPods.com. You can purchase as many Doc Pods as you want. So stop putting off that medical treatment. Buy a Doc Pod or two and feel like new. Thank you. Let's see if I can advance my slide here. I know it hasn't. Yeah, it's not displaying up here. That's our, our little technical issue. But okay. Let's see. How well can I engage you? Uh, I can't, uh, we don't have it on my screen, I'm sorry. Okay, so we'll just proceed to questions. Uh, so, oh, here, here it is. Um, we are raising five million in an initial investment capital that we would need to be broken down into tranches of two and a half million. And we would love to uh, work with an investor group or syndication that can help us with a $20 million follow-on round. Uh, Doc Ponds is a capital intensive company to serve uh, the United States um, in this change in healthcare. Um, investors can expect liquidity with uh, subsequent financing rounds, and Doc Ponds is the type of company that we would expect to have an IPO within five years. Th this is the start of the Doc Ponds team. As you know, I'm a sole founder of Doc Ponds, but we do have some key uh, members of the team working with Doc Ponds currently. At the very top is Bob Berg. He's uh, our, our healthcare legal team uh, leader. Jennifer Dumpy, Dumpy's on the side. She's gonna lead our SEO marketing. Down at the bottom, we have an IT transition person. His name is Will Berryman. He built the 2.0 version of our Doc Ponds website. And on the other side of me is Bill Burke. He's a senior advisor to Doc Ponds and business development. Um, we have retained a D DLA Piper through their Venture Pipeline program to assist us on our corporate side of law. Silver Pop will provide our email service provider or your email service provider, Shop Visible is our e-commerce platform partner, and Touchpoint Data will help us with our data compilation. Thank you. And I'd like to open it up to the judges to ask questions. Thanks so much for, um, for the presentation. Great, um, great start. So first question, how are you planning to acquire physicians and um, how do you anticipate your local sales force uh, will grow? What does it need to look like? Uh, that's an excellent question. For the past four months or so, uh, we've been in negotiations with a large health insurance provider. I don't know if I'm interfering. Uh, a large health insurance provider that has a network of 600,000 uh, providers. Now there are about 950,000 outpatient healthcare providers in the United States. So about two thirds of those would be open to Doc Ponds with this partnership agreement that we've been working on. Um, it would do a couple of things. It would reduce uh, the out, the, the insurance provider has an incentive to work with Doc Ponds because it would reduce uh, the, the price of a premium from about $250 per individual down to $71 as long as they're combined with Doc Ponds coupons and we cover the outpatient care services portion. Uh, the opening, it wouldn't be a cold call, for instance, to this network of 600,000 providers. They would be marketed to through their insurance agents um, for this cash option for their patients. Doc Ponds works best with insurance, but it can work without it. And of course, it works best with large healthcare networks, not only insurance companies, but large networks like Wellstar or outpatient care centers. And we've been in contact with a number of them. So just as a follow-up, so I make sure I understand. Is it your expectation that the insurance provider is actually signing up, you know, office by office? No, for no, that would be, that would, that's what we would do. That's what our staff would do, but that network would be open to us through the insurance agency. So instead of going practice by practice, physician by physician, dentist by dentist, we would tap into a network. And that network would say, listen, if 
we can, you know, we want to sell more outpatient, or excuse me, we want to sell more high deductible plans, and we can find them with doc ponds, then it incentivizes people to buy our health plan um, because it's much, much cheaper. We can, we won't, when they're used together, it really reduces the cost to the individual and to the employer. Can I ask, what is the, um, what are the economics to the care provider? So are they, is it, is, is this, are they making more money or losing more money per patient? What, how, how are the doctors benefiting or hurting? Sure. So there are a number of physicians that have gone to cash only, even surgeons, believe it or not, that are doing gallbladder replacements or, or saying, hey, we'd rather just have cash only. Now their price point is much higher. It might be $2,500 for a gallbladder removal, but there is a trend to move toward cash pay primarily because there are delays in compensation with insurance up to three months, and they have to collect from patients their portion, which really provides a revenue gap for a lot of outpatient care practices. Administrative costs can range 20 to 30 percent of an outpatient care, you know, uh, on their bottom line. It takes that away with uh, negotiating with health care, excuse me, third-party payers, and no, with patients and their collection systems. So what Doc Ponds does for the, for the physician practice is remove that. So every person that purchases a DocPons coupon purchases the face value of the coupon. We expect to keep our primary care coupons for dental, vision, and histories, you know, physical exam and histories, down to under $100 per coupon. DocPons return 60% of every coupon sold to the practitioner. We have a preferred provider program in place where once to, to provide continuity of care with their new patients, uh, we increase profit sharing 2% every year with each new doc pond. So most people see a, um, let's say, an internist or a gynecologist once a year. They might see a dentist twice a year and a vision care provider every one to two years. It, with, with continuing to send out doc ponds on an internal list to their existing patients, doc ponds will increase the incentivization to those practitioners. Okay, I'm afraid I have to call it. Unfortunately, I see Margit. You're so ready. Do you, do you a quick question? Just since we're judging teams as well, do you have a snapshot on your background? Yes. Um, I'm a physician by training. I trained in general and cardiac surgery. Um, my training was at UCSF in general surgery. I did my research uh, fellowship in cardiac surgery at the San Francisco VA. Um, I did my cardiac surgery training at Stanford at the Folk Cardiovascular Center. Um, much later in my career, um, I did an MBA at Emory. So I'm a physician MBA. Yeah. Yeah, that's you. Let's give it up for Doc Pond's Dr. Susan Nichols. And I would love to call up our next team. Our next team is a male-female combo, a dynamic duo, in fact. Miss Caitlin Watson and Mr. Corey Jones. And they're going to tell you about Dink Life. And Happy judges, Valentine's you can take this moment to take a few notes, whatever you need to do. <laughs> do you need a pen? Is that a sign for a pen that works? Oh, I have a pen. You got one. Okay. Oh, Good. No, no. Just checking. <laughs> All yours. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Did you have a good lunch? Really glad to have you here. Um, so this is Corey Jones. Yep. And I, I'm really just up here to introduce you guys can hear me through the mic. Just up here to introduce my rock star co-founder. She was named among the top 10 digital marketers in the country in 2011 by the leading industry organization, iMedia. She is a true rock star, proud to have her on the team, Caitlin Watson. Thanks, Corey. So Dink Life is the first and only social and services platform for couples without kids. We're here today because couples are the new family, or at least the new version of it, and not just because it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> more and more couples are waiting longer than ever to have kids. What was once a blip in the life stage of our parents' generation is now a full life stage unto itself. Those are actually my friends, and so if you know them, don't tell them that I put them in a deck. <laughs> um, also, more and more women and couples in general are choosing not to have kids at all. That's actually one in five. So the result is that couples without kids are 31 million strong in the US and 131 million globally. Yet unlike all other adult life stages, they have no targeted brands or lifestyle resources to suit their needs. 60% of us in the US 
will be a part of a couple without kids at one point in our life. Dink life, it's putting a face and a name on the lifestyle. Dual income, no kids couples, dinks. Um, <laughs> so self-titled dinks are very unique. Um, they're the second fastest growing demographic. They have the second highest disposable income and they're unique as individuals and live a unique lifestyle. And because they had nothing, we asked them what they wanted most. And they told us they wanted to meet others like them. A lot of their friends had moved on and had children, and so they were left to rebuild their inner network of, of go-to friends. Um, they also wanted to find things to do for their lifestyle, as well as just relevant information, um, like tax, secret tax deductions if you don't have any dependents. So we gave them what they asked for. <laughs> We gave them what they asked for. We launched Dink Life Beta in May as a way to assess the appeal of the Dink Life concept and also the platform from which to build future products. We've seen a great response, tons of feedback. Um, we have hundreds, lots of user-generated content on the site, like stories and travel itineraries. Um, but most recently, we launched our first social tool in Q4. It's called Meetouts. Um, Meetouts allows Dinks to uh, set up an event. So they create an event in their, their local area, and then we invite Dink Life members who are nearby. So we match zip codes and we, we make that introduction for them. So from this platform, we're building the global platform for the couple's lifestyle. We'll also phase in other products like Dink Deals, personalized friend match, local event recommendations, and ratings and reviews for Dinks. We'll drive revenue through proven business models such as brand advertising, commission sales, and premium subscription. Most importantly and best of all, we've already gone to market. Dinks are loving our beta site and they are who we thought they were. We've proven that they have a higher household income as well as higher education, which has already allowed us to partner with Martini Media, an affluent ad network from which we're already driving revenue. Also, we've seen tons of user engagement with over 75,000 users on the site, and as I mentioned, tons of user-generated content. Most importantly, we've already tested targeted online marketing, proving a low-cost acquisition and scalability, which we then built into our bottoms-up forecast model to forecast revenue and conversion for Dink Life. We have an amazing team. Wow. We have an amazing team. My co-founder, Corey, is a rock star business strategist. Um, he's worked with tons of brands and really helped turn a lot of those brands around. Also, Xavier is a Drupal expert. He's been part of that Drupal community since the very beginning. So we're really here today looking for the right partners to help us shape this lifestyle. We've already, we're bootstrapping with $100,000 in seed funding, but we're ready to take it to the next level. Um, we are, we're ready to get in market with, with more marketing to drive awareness and scale as well as build out the remaining products for Dink Life that I already mentioned. We're really putting a face and a name on the only remaining life stage that doesn't have one. So help shape it with us. We'd love to talk to you during the conference to get your feedback. Please follow us at Dink Life. Cheers. Judges, please <laughs> jump on in there. Uh, so, uh, Thanks for putting that together. I, I hope I may not need your service over time, but let's see. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the way, do you have kids? I shouldn't ask that. Uh, so I think Good I like this whole thing. There's a hypothesis that uh, these people think of themselves as dinks and identify themselves as such, and that uh, Facebook and whatever other means there might be to meet people or just real life where they have actual friends in, in the real world might not be sufficient for their purposes, and so they need some sort of an online community. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an unproven hypothesis. And if I were you, I would make sure I tested that to the core. And I'd love to know if you have done so and you really have comfort that there's a large enough community of people who self-identify themselves as such and uh, needs a specific vertically targeted service for themselves. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the natural question. We, so there's two ways to test the hypothesis. And one, of course, is research. I probably should have mic'd up here. Uh, one is research, the other is, is actual data, right? Collecting actual data, and we've done both to this point. So the, before we launched, and before we launched the brand, uh, far before we had a beta site, we put some real focus into research. We talked to people, we interviewed people on the streets, we sent surveys, we talked to couples, and we asked them, do you live a unique lifestyle? Do you feel like your lifestyle is different from your friends who are parents, friends who are still single, and if so, what are those differences? And we collected that information, and that led us to 
invest in building something, and then since now building something, the users that we've had thus far, we're seeing them come in and say, we're so grateful for what you've done here. And we're seeing, obviously right now, it's all early adopters. So you know that, that's just putting the truth out there. But they are saying they love it. They're saying it's much needed. And you know when we talk to people and we share it out, we hear the same thing. So I think the, the, the proof is in the pudding. We'll continue to see how it goes as we get scale. I had a question about the, this may seem counterintuitive, but sort of the broadness of the demographic that you're addressing, because there's folks who happen not to have, couples, excuse me, who happen not to have children but intend to. There are um, gay and lesbian couples. I mean, there's a, it's a fairly broad spectrum of folks. So if, and I come from an advertising background, so when I think of this as a great advertising demographic, which it is, it's a really desirable demographic, there's a lot of income, right? Um, but when I think about targeting it, I think that mm, it's a little bit broad here. Have you thought that through? How, how are you thinking about the demographics that you're actually addressing? We absolutely have. We, and we think, I think it's one of the biggest things we think about, and that's how, we're, how we've built the brand, who we've built it for, and how we communicate that message. And we've really been in a process of continually growing and learning that. So we launched, you know, middle of last year, and this, each month, it's, in some cases, we've rewritten our positioning statement. The way we show the, what the brand is to the customer, we've been reevaluating it constantly. And where we've landed right now is the focus, the, the majority of people will always be, the big audience will always be people who are going to have kids later. They're just taking their time, they're enjoying this life stage. The, there is a big audience, and a lot of our early adopters tend to be this growing audience, and Caitlin showed you it's now one in five women that are not ever going to have kids. And that audience is obviously another great audience because they are they never leave. They're always your customer. Um, but we're finding that they both both audiences share the same need, and that's to connect with others like them, to find things to do that are relevant to them, and to access information relevant to their lifestyle. So whether it be you know if it's something like t tax implications, like Caitlin mentioned, that applies whether it's a, a gay dink couple, whether it's a a couple that's going to have kids later or never going to have kids. But we're continually learning and growing on that. Love any more input that you have on that front. <clears throat> I think we're good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you guys Thanks so everyone. much. Please give it up for Dink Life. So our next team is coming at us from an exactly different stage of life. This is Evo Inc. Yasmin is behind us. Um, Ruan and Avishai are coming up on stage and setting up the laptop. And while they're doing it, I'll just tell you a little bit about, they call themselves Mint for Parents. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we Evo. What we do is we provide parents with personalized services based on data that we gather from their own baby. But uh, let me start by uh, introducing the team. Here on my left is Avishai. Avishai is our CEO. He's a father of two. He has a lot of experience building and selling cool products. On my other left is Ron. Ron is our CTO. He's our algorithm guru. He writes all those cool algorithms I'll be talking about in a second. My name is Yasmin, I'm mother of three young, awesome kids. I'm our on the ground person, uh, making sure things actually happen. <laughs> now, me being a mom, Vishai being a dad, and I'm sure many of you here are parents as well, we kind of have a lot in common. Uh, we're busy, our lifestyle is very busy. Last night I was in a Women 2.0 dinner in the city. Now I'm here on stage, tomorrow I'm actually going overseas. And we all love our mobile phones. I feel like my entire life, I get everything I need from that, from that device. And it's like we all know this is the information age. There's so much information out there. Um, the problem is we want to provide the best care we can, we, you know, we can to our children that we love so much. But at the same time, we want to maintain our busy lifestyle. Now, um, Eva's solution 
is basically providing parents on their mobile devices personal, personalized services based on data that we gather from, the, from your own baby. Now, how do we get this data? Uh, look at the baby's room at the monitor that's currently there. It's not much more than a glorified walkie-talkie. What we do is we take the nifty algorithms that run right and we put them on the monitor. Now, we don't make monitors, but we make the monitors smarter. Um, with those algorithms, we can collect data about your own baby and later offer you services. Uh, for example, we have a cry detection algorithm. That algorithm can detect when the baby is crying and for how long and learn from that about sleep schedule. We have video processing algorithms that can tell you what is the baby's skin temperature or um, can capture on video hidden moments on how the baby, uh, well, how was the baby that specific moment. Now, Vishay, what do you do with all this information? So the first thing we do is we bring the baby monitor into the modern age, connect it to smartphones, let you at a tap of a button, see your baby, hear your baby. But more than that, we're all busy. We want alerts when the baby cries, when the, parent, when the baby actually needs us, when we're out to dinner, at work. Now that's all great, it's the basic monitor functionality. But a lot more important than that is the data itself from the dashboard. We collect the crying data, we collect the hidden moments, we collect even some uh, medically relevant data, and based on that data, show the parents the baby's schedule and information, but also drive real services. So sleep coaches have taught us how to write the algorithms that parse the baby's nighttime schedule into how to deliver the right content to improve. We've seen how, uh, sorry, coaches and the consultants that know how to instruct the parents on how to leave your child with a nanny help the out. These are a lot of services that we build based on that data. Now, where are we right now? Essentially, we took this theory, put it on smartphones as an app-only solution, and put it out there in the market. Essentially, you had to have an extra smartphone to leave in the baby's room. And even that solution by itself, using an extra smartphone, has already generated the interest and the feedback we wanted. Now, obviously, the reviews from the Today Show and Babbel were great, and the users, which actually pay us for some of their services, were also nice. But most importantly, it drove our biggest distribution strategy. We had an insight in the company that consumer electronic companies, the one that make baby monitors, are actually facing real, real troubles here. Their margins are eroding. They're making products, selling them on shelves, but they can't make enough money per product because of stiff competition. So they're innovating. You see, Sony's CEO two days ago said products are no longer enough. We need them to enable content and services to really drive profit. And that's what Evo does for them in the baby space. Essentially, we put our algorithms on baby monitors that they manufacture, and those algorithms drive connectivity and the services. We have one deal signed with Belkin to put a monitor in the, in the shelf already on, in September. We already finished development of it. That monitor has the Evo's algorithms. It enables all our services, hundreds of thousands of units in the next few, two years. We already s agreed to terms with a, with a video monitor to enable our video services and have a third one lined up. Essentially, these consumer electronic companies uh, help us by getting, giving us distribution and manufacturing and scale on the shelves. We help them by driving more revenue through the margins. We make our money by getting NRE from these guys to cover the, the, the development, but more importantly, royalty per device sold and 75% of all the services we upsell. Cry alerts, data, schedules, sleep coaching, all these things we keep a majority of while they're happy for another, for another revenue stream. In summary, we're raising another million dollars right now to scale both algorithm services and more partnerships because we're always hungry in that sense. Thank you. So Kinder's right on it. She's ready. Uh, my first question is, you know, clearly you're targeting a very specific um, point in a parent's life, right? Their children are young. You may be obsessive or not. You may want a nanny cam or not. There's a bunch of things going on in your mind about your child. One of the questions I have is, you know, you have a strategy for a very young child. What happens, you know, to capture more of the share of wallet now that you have the share of mind of a parent? as these children grow up, because otherwise you have a very finite, you know, pool, if you will, or attention span from each parent you've now, you know, got, got to adopt your service. So I'm really curious about that. What's great about database services, we've seen the trend for adults and for young adults, the whole fitness, the measurement and everything. Our, what's special about what we're doing is we're capturing that data from early on that's relevant. So of course our next step, this is relevant for zero to two, sleep, nannies, all those things. The two to four category is all about uh, 
daycare, the first time they're experiencing different things in, in their uh, evolution of lifestyle, and it goes on from there. Now, I can't tell you obviously right now what we're doing at 16 to 18 years old, because that's further on, but to be fair, part of our long-term strategy is to grow with those ages, with the child. We get the first two years. We start aggregating their data for, for them. It's the first step. And so we definitely have that on our roadmap. We're just focused, laser focused to be honest, on getting as much penetration into the zero two category. And would the plan be to always partner with some sort of hardware provider at every stage? How, how does that work? So, so we started out, quite honestly, with a hardware device of our own. We had a thousand devices, to, and we needed them. I mean, we needed them to prove to those consumer electronic companies, because if not, to be frank, you're just a Silicon Valley service guy. So we actually made a thousand devices and sold a bunch of them. They weren't the best, we'll be honest. They, you know, they're doing really well, actually. But the, the answer is we th we've proven that first stage, the audio. For the video monitor, we didn't even need to create a prototype anymore. They're actually standing in line and negotiating with us about limited exclusivity so we could do it. They need us, we need them. So that's our scaling, yes. Can I, um, so I think you guys did a really great job of explaining sort of the capture of the data. It's amazing. Um, what I feel like maybe you didn't explain enough was what then actually happens in terms of content and services. Mm -hmm. It was a little sure. short. Can you oh, explain a little bit more? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. apparently I, I talk a lot in this <laughs> company. <laughs> sure, so we're, we're, our approach is not all inclusive. We're not saying we're baby center right now and we wanna do everything for every mom. We wanna bring value where the data is relevant. So for example, sleep is the no-brainer no for us, and it's one of the three big categories. Having so, been a new parent a couple of times, I know how important us. sleep is, yes. Sleep okay. is huge. <laughs> and the fact that the data has significant relevance to the sleep coaches that work with us is the basis for that as a first vertical. We not only target content specially made by them for mobile for the Evos applications. Who's making the content? The sleep know. coaches. There's so, sleep okay. lady. Okay. Okay. We're, we're working to, it's joint ownership, but they, they write, write it. We don't write it. You know, even being like experienced veteran parents, I thought I know everything to know about right. sleep. You're and going I to the experts, I think, is my guess. Amazed by how experts. much, yeah, by how you're, much you're they tell us about it. You have a baby API? <laughs> API to your baby? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so uh, actually, it seems to me the, these <laughs> monitors, I mean, it's a great idea. I, I, I love the fact that you're using phones and doing more intelligent things and all that, but uh, it seems to me these baby monitors are still going to limit what you're c able to do. And isn't, wouldn't uh, the cost of something like an Android phone come down over time so that you could just take one of those, rebrand it, repackage it, use all the sensors, and that thing can actually talk back to the baby, right? It can actually give data back. You can talk back so, to the so baby. Yeah. yeah, virtual nanny. You can talk back you know, to the baby, baby with baby monitors. Or. So even with monitors, you can talk back to the baby. I want to outsource my parenting to India. Right. <laughs> okay. But it turns out, by the way, parent, the babies hate that. The babies hate when you talk back to them and throw monitor. So even the companies that thought to put it in aren't putting it in. They, they get really frustrated, where's mom? Now, to answer your question, we thought of this an app-only solution because there'll be more mom. and more secondary devices, like you said. We're platform but indifferent. We don't, we don't care. care. I mean, we have We have app. our own apps that are running, right? Exactly. And yeah. uh, I'm sure there, there are lots of legal issues with this, so you can't market it as like a medical life monitoring device in case baby stops breathing. But is there some subtle way to slip that in, like irregular so we uh, do breathing that. alerts? Or we do that. that. We partner already with a company that does a little thing that you put on a diaper that actually measures like the angel care does underneath. So that's our distribution. To be frank, the U.S. consumers don't care. Those don't sell in the U.S. at all. So even though our partners are going global, we're still focused on U.S. and writing their distribution for the global presence. But you're right. It's great. Pretty way. cool. Great. Thank you. I think every... Thank you. Everyone's good? Wonderful. Let's have a round of applause for Evos. Okay, so while our next company is getting their microphones on and setting up their computers, I want to remind you all that disrupt.pitchlift.org is where you can vote for your favorite pitches. So I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're thinking about it. Disrupt.pitchlift.org. I know, it's too long. You won't remember. But they're in the room, in the exhibit hall. You can find them, and they're at the Tropo table, and they'll tell you all about what they're doing, all about their application, and what it can do for you. They are also one of our sponsors. So while Dick is up here setting up this company, this laptop, I'll tell you a little bit about them. <clears throat> this is Tiny Review, which is Instagram for reviews. So Dick is here, and Melissa is getting her, her oh, maybe she's going to do an entrance. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
And just a quick reminder that we have one more company after this, and then you will be able to retire to the exterior room where we will have cupcakes and wine. Because you should have cupcakes and wine on Valentine's Day. I'm Melissa. Let me show you how we're going to capture the world. Three lines at a time. Yelp wants you to rate a burger joint. The new guys want you to rate the burger. But you just want to share your experience. Tiny Review is the Instagram for local reviews. Let me show you how it works. Take a picture, at three lines, and share it with the world. It is really easy. The power of the app is its simplicity and design constraint. You only get three lines. It is the constraint that drives the usage and creativity. Just like how Twitter's 140 characters made it easy for everybody to publish. Now, it's really amazing what you, can just, what you can do with just three lines. Unless you're a professional photographer, it is nearly impossible to capture your personality and the context of the moment into the photos that you take. One of our users took this pretty photo and transformed it into a compelling story. <laughs> really easily. Our users like this, react to this, and for the first time, people are actually sharing reviews. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you saw a Yelp review on Facebook? Now that I've shown you the basics, let me show you some of the creativity on Tiny Review. Of course, we see reviews. <laughs> really compelling ones. But we also see people getting married, singing songs. <laughs> they have babies. A lot of them. <laughs> we see romance. We also see foreign romance. <laughs> Guys, this is awesome. We're not live in Asia. We see people expressing their daily frustrations. <laughs> and we see them wishing that they could just stop time. Tiny Review takes the mundane moments in life and turns them into captivating stories. And so far, users have indicated we're going in the right direction, up and to the right. So in the two short months since our beta launch, we have 34,000 Tiny Reviews created, and we're getting new ones every few minutes. Of our 24,000 users, 30% have created content. Compare that to Yelp's 1%. But why should you care? You see, people love to express themselves, and they do it all day long. So it's no surprise that 40% of our content is reviews. This is the important part. It is the storytelling and user expression that drives growth and engagement and it is the reviews that drive the value. How much do you think this is worth to Starbucks? Because we have 400 more of these. Businesses are asking us today, hey, can I put those tiny reviews on my Facebook fan page? And it's because tiny review is quick to create and they hit you right in the gut. What we have here is user-generated marketing ad copy. 
and it's powerful. So who's behind this awesome opportunity? My co-founder Dick, Codes, I design. We're growing the team. So if you want to talk about the future of local reviews and expression, come and talk to us. Once again, I'm Melissa, and we are Tiny Review. Judges, please. You talk about how much money you want to raise and what you want to do with it? Yes. Yes. Um. <laughs> That's why we're here. Oh. Um, over the next three months, we're looking to raise 500K more um, and expand the team. 300. We've raised 300 today and looking to raise 500 more. Grow, grow, grow. Grow yes. the team. We are Good. working on Android uh, presence since halfway done, um, scale up the web presence, and do lots of A-B testing, A -B testing accelerate growth. Okay. So the bigger the team, the faster how, we go. How many reviews do you think Yelp has? Oh, good question. And how many tiny reviews equals one Yelp review? And how fast are you growing? Because if you, even if you have a small user base, if you're getting 30% of contribute reviews and Yelp gets a 1% contribution rate, there's some point at which you become the number two or the number one review force, right? You can plot that out right now. Yeah. And it may not be that large of a number, is my guess. Yeah. It's going fast. The, the one thing is we are not very focused right now on the consumption of reviews on the app because we don't have the density across the world. So our trick to getting density to solve the chicken and egg problem is to have it a fun single player game. In the back end we're creating, we're, we're obtaining content and at some point we can turn around and say, hey, now we know exactly um, what is hot and what isn't in this area. Now we can inspire you where to go for lunch. Yeah, so it took Yelp $60 million and six years to get where they are today. We think we can do it much faster and cheaper. Right. <laughs> So this strikes me as somewhat of a like Twitter meets Yelp kind of right. thing, right? Because you know Twitter is this great self-expression. I love the three-line limit. Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I really love it. Like I'm going to use it tonight. But um, you know, it, in terms of new usage, new consumer is coming onto it. Um, are they thinking they're going to look at reviews? Are they thinking? What are they? That's a great what's, point. What are they so, thinking about? Yeah, so we actually, so we hear that some people are, they don't know yet if they should download because they're not the type of person that writes reviews. However, once there's a little bit of exposure to the content, they realize that there is a license to be, to use the word loosely and use it for any kind of expression. However, we are tied to local. So there, there is a point in time when you create a review that we have to choose your location or you can skip it. I use, I actually download Yeah. Yeah, so, so, it's like, so it's right there if you want to do it. So there, we still see a lot of reviews, like eating and going to venues and, and being out and about is a big part of people's day. So we find that sharing. I almost feel like you're forcing that behavior when it's such a great overall self-expression tool. I don't know. I mean, yeah. We have this discussion every yeah. day. Okay. <laughs> should, we, should we change the name, should we not? Should we change the name or should we not based right. on, on perception? Um, I'm not going to download this because I'm not into reviews where I am. Um, there's, and that's part of the why we need to build out a web presence too, to make users comfortable, see other content, to get a sense of what the app is about. Uh, the idea is at some point you reach a scale and it doesn't matter anymore. Um, people associate your name with what you are. Um, but yes, we hear your point. Yeah, we hear you. And I think the right way to do it is to test it on the web and test a few different iterations and then actually take a real data, or some real data to make a decision like that. But I, I think just riffing off this point is somebody who was a polyvore. <laughs> I'm on the board of Trip and has spent time with Twitter. I understand what you guys are doing and I think it's very cool, right? Um, where is the density of usage right now, right? I mean, this like so you have this, you know, this path you want to go to on usage, right, which is local reviews. Where's the density of usage right now? Have you categorized the content that's coming in? And I would love to just understand, like, to her point, right, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful self-expression tool, and your desired use case for it is local reviews. But is that where you're seeing the density of content creation, if that makes sense, right? I'm just looking to see, like, 
What's the commercial yeah. value? So sixty percent of the content is not something that can be consumed as a review, but forty percent is, and so it becomes a curation issue. Like, can yeah, yeah. you? Yeah, of course. Can you collect it right. together so that you're finding exactly what so you want? So you're seeing a forty percent sort of data, 40, 60, thing, yeah, yeah. data to noise ratio on the commercial value of the content. Yeah, there's also there's also a lot of other content that's like hilarious status yeah. updates, yeah. social commentary. That's also really, really cool yeah. to consider. I was just, yeah, yeah. want to understand where the corpus of creation was. Yeah. How long did it take you to rehearse that pitch where you can do it without ever looking at the screen? <laughs> 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 Timing was amazing. Let's give it up for Tiny Review. <laughs> Okay, I know that I stand between you and cupcakes. I made that problem. But you have one more review, two lovely ladies who are going to talk to you about a very large market, actually, college preparatory market. So I'm going to introduce Cece and Connie, who will be here. They're going to set up their laptops. And while I do that, I'm going to tell you one more time about going to what place? Disrupt.pitchlift org so that you can participate. We are a community. Women 2.0 is a community. And we are only a community if all of you participate. So we want to crowdsource this event. We want you to be a part of it. That means go to Tropo, look up the instructions, figure out what you need to do, and vote. Vote for these amazing companies with female founders. Look at all of you. Are you ladies ready? Like we're gonna? Working. Yep. Okay. Yep. You're up. Oh, do I need to? Is the sound working? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Connie, and this is my co-founder Cece, and we're here to talk about Hot Seat, the best way to prepare for tough job interviews. Some quick background about ourselves. We met at the University of Chicago, where we both majored in economics. But we love building things with computers. For example, I've built programs ranging from AI to SMS applications. And I'm an interaction designer, and I've led product design for three venture-funded startups. So let's start with a scenario some of you may be familiar with. Say you're interviewing at a firm that you would kill to work for when your interviewer says, out of the blue, how many people are using Facebook in San Francisco at 2.30 p.m. on a Friday? Does anyone have any good answers? For those of you who don't already know, that was a question asked over there at Google. The fact is, there are hundreds of firms and graduate schools where the interview process is stressful and unpredictable. There are 12 million undergraduate students going through case interviews at consulting firms, technical finance questions at banks, teaching simulations at Teach for America, and so on. If you're anything like me, um, you have to rely on just yourself to prepare for interviews. Um, one thing you can do is buy expensive vault guides or case prep interviews that, or case prep books that can add up to hundreds of dollars, or you can crawl the forums for hours. It's not working. It's not, it's not plugged in. Um, but what you'll find is that the, con the content on these, uh, or of these options is really, really lacking, and so is the opportunity for you to get feedback on your performance. Our company, Hot Seat, is going to change how this works. Here's how. So say you have a college senior named Bonnie. Hello. Bonnie has an interview at JP Morgan next week, so she, like many people, types up JP Morgan interviews on Google, and let's say Hot Seat is the first result. She goes to Hot Seat, and finds that there's not just a great amount of information and tips, textual information and tips, but also video interviews and user-generated responses to the types of questions that Connie's probably going to receive next week. So right now, Connie's really excited about the product, and she wants to sign up. All she needs to do is pick the industries that she's interested in, and then she gets a list of relevant interviews. So say she picks this first interview. It says to walk me through a discounted cash flow. Well, if you have $100 of cash flowing and you get a 20% discount, then you only have to pay 80 bucks. OK. So maybe Bonnie's engineering degree did not prepare her for a career in finance. <laughs> but what she has now is a place to review all of her answers, get feedback, or 
or see the right answer to all of the questions and then get feedback. So one way that Bonnie can get feedback on Hot Seat is to tap into the Hot Seat network. One person that Bonnie might want to tap into is Stefan, an MBA applicant and current iBanker. Um, Stefan is on Hot Seat because he wants to access Stanford specific questions. If Stefan gives Bonnie good feedback, he gets karma points that let him access more Hot Seat feedback or Hot Seat content. So as you can see, what we're really trying to do on Hot Seat is create a community. And that's what makes us different from any other way that people prepare for interviews right now. So how will we make money? There are many possibilities in our space. One market we can really go after is the college career offices. We know for a fact that hundreds of career offices each spend thousands of dollars for access to a site called Interview Stream, University of Chicago included. But we also know that they have very low student adoption rates because we believe their experience is clunky and is no mechanism for social feedback. So we think we could really get traction and quickly in this market. Other ideas we've been considering is selling advertisements and having paid job listings, selling premium subscriptions to, for special content, and doing candidate screening for HR departments. The point I'm trying to make is we've been executing on our ideas, and we're ready to execute more. Just to give you an idea of the timeline of Hot Seat, we started thinking about it in October of 2011, and in a couple of weekends, we built a working prototype in time to apply for Women 2.0. So... <laughs> <laughs> to fill more interviews and ideal responses for the top six industries in time for spring recruiting. Then, while this is going on, we'll do investigative sales and marketing with potential partners. And by fall recruiting season, we hope to have a community of job seekers. Of active job seekers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so what we're asking for right now um, is first your feedback, um, and we're also looking for $100,000 in seed funding to get our idea off the ground and us into fall recruiting. Um, we invite all of you to go right now to demo.gethotseat.com to try your hand at answering the age-long question, tell me about yourself, and <laughs> post it up on Hot Seat. Um, we look forward to your feedback and questions. Uh, congratulations, it's a nice presentation, well put together, funny, uh, and it's great to see uh, an all-female designer developer team. Um, it's a rare combination, it's very impressive. So, but, <laughs> I, I'm a little concerned you're going after a small and transient market. Like, it's hard to capture these people at just the right time. By the time that they like your service enough that you might be able to extract value from them, they're done and they've moved on. Um, so it's a very short relationship. Uh, and on top of it, you're kind of in an arms race because the reason the companies are asking these questions to figure out if these people are smart, not if they can do a Google search. So as soon as they find their own content online, they're gonna change the kinds of questions they ask. So I'm wondering if you can apply this model into some way that it's either broader or less gameable or can extend the lifespan of the relationship you have with the customer. Sure, so to answer like the last half of your question, which is about, you know, are they just gonna start asking different questions? Well, the point of practicing for interviews is not that you're practiced for every single question and you have a canned response for every single question. The idea is that you have the confidence and poise to sort of talk about yourself and then attack any other type of question. And I think that those are the type of people that will be using Hot Seat to just sort of connect with new people, talk about their careers and about themselves in a way that they are sort of just not comfortable doing already. Um, and, and to answer the first part of your question, um, I can see your point that if, we're, if our website is successful and we land people jobs, then why would they want to use our website now that they have jobs? So, I guess what you're saying we, is it's a career networking site, but this is the bait. The interview questions are the bait to get them into your larger career networking site. I mean, I think that's what your co-founder said, sort right. of. 
Yeah. But it's not in your pitch, right? In your pitch, you don't see that larger vision. It's just, just interview questions, which is fine. I mean, you're raising 100K to build it, but just I think that would be interesting to see kind of the, the next vision behind it. We have many other ideas. Of like <laughs> <laughs> besides, besides just the uh, college student. Tell us. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> For example, you know how there's a recruiter market and they get a share of the first year's salary for each person they recruit. So if our tool is useful enough and it gets people comfortable and confident to talk about their skills and lands in the job, then we could partner with the recruiters. And another possibility is to partner with companies directly and be like the de facto platform for interviews because, you know, like, you can only get so much information from someone's resume. Mm -hmm. So if video screening. people, like Cece said, if we had video screening for the in entry level rounds, then. You, you could let JP Morgan in the back watch the actual practice attempts so you could sell them out <laughs> in the back end. Secretly, <laughs> secretly, no, 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 we never do that. But, uh, yeah. I agree with everything he says, so I don't want to repeat it, but you guys did a great job on the presentation, and um, it's, a, it's a solid idea, so work from there, I think. Thanks. Thanks.